This seemingly harmless ball for the uninitiated looks like any old piece of metal. A cannonball or a small wrecking ball maybe. But if you had the misfortune to handle this incorrectly, you would most certainly have a painful and horrible death. Sadly, two people had such an experience and more would die prematurely of cancer over subsequent decades. And arguably, the two incidents showed how you can't take for granted a material with the potential of going super critical at the drop of a hat. Unsurprisingly, the item in question would gain the name the Demon Core. But what was this innocuous looking item? This subject has been covered before by someone I know, but I found this story really interesting and I had to do a video about it. I've included the link in the video description if you'd like to check it out once you finish watching this video. Like many of my atomic videos, our story starts during the Second World War and the Manhattan Project. The Demon Core, or Rufus as it was originally nicknamed, was intended to be used in a third atomic bomb to be dropped on Japan, a weapon that was never needed. On the 15th of August, Japan surrendered after two atomic bombs being detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The core was similar to the one used in the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki, consisting of three pieces, two plutonium gallium hemispheres separated by a ring. The plutonium core was refined and hot pressed into its ominous spherical shape at Hanford and shipped to Los Alamos Laboratory for preparation for use in an implosion type bomb. Once assembled, it was designed to be 5% below critical mass, leaving the core somewhat safe. However, 5% was to ensure that when needed, it could be used to make a very large explosion easily. But one deadly side effect was that this left very little margin for error. You see, once the core went critical, it would be in a perfect state of equilibrium, no increase or decrease in power. However, one in many different factors could send the core into supercriticality, creating and sustaining a chain reaction, until it either settled at a new criticality level and increased power or explode. Needless to say, both outcomes would be a bit of a bad thing. The scientists at the Manhattan Project found themselves with this surplus piece of weapons grade material and they did what most scientists would do, study and push the boundaries. However, some of the experiments were outright reckless and this leads us to the core's first victim. Harry Daglian, a 24-year-old physicist from New London, Connecticut, was working on the core on the 21st of August 1945. Daglian had been on the staff of the Manhattan Project since 1944, joining while still a graduate student. On a fateful day, Daglian was making a neutron reflector around the core of tungsten carbide. A neutron reflector, funnily enough, is designed to reflect neutrons, back into a subcritical mass, making the material critical. It can also increase nuclear fission a critical mass is capable of. The neutron reflector experiment was being performed alone, apart from private Robert J. Hemley, who was sat behind a desk four meters away on guard duty. Whilst undertaking the experiment, Daglian noticed that the addition of a final tungsten brick would render the core supercritical. He withdrew the brick with his hand, in doing so accidentally dropping it onto the pile. This was all that was needed for the core to go prompt critical. Immediately, he tried to remove the brick by knocking it off and was unsuccessful. Instead, he quickly disassembled the pile, but by this time, he had absorbed 510 REM of neutron radiation. His fate was sealed. He received intensive care, but would fall into a coma and pass away 25 days after the incident the first known death linked to a criticality accident. His hand shown here had the skin burned off from the event. Daglin's body was transported back to New London to be buried in Cedar Grove. The tragic accident that led to Daglin's death sparked a review of safety regulations within the project. One of the major changes was that any similar experiment would require two personnel and two instruments capable of monitoring and alerting neutron counts. These new rules put in place were thought to reduce the risk of a criticality accident. However, this would not be the case when it came to the soon to be nicknamed Demon Core. Just nine months would go by until the core experienced its second criticality accident due an experiment nicknamed Tickling the Dragon's Tail so named due to the apparent disregard to standard safety practices. Louis Slotin was a 35-year-old Canadian physicist and chemist, having worked on the Manhattan Project since 1942. He worked on experiments with uranium and plutonium cores to assess their critical mass amount. Needless to say, he was experienced, but possibly he had become complacent. 
Zlotin had become quite the showman when doing experiments, and this had not changed leading up to his planned exit from the Manhattan Project. Zlotin had become increasingly unhappy in his involvement in the project, however he could not leave until a replacement had been trained up. He had been quoted saying, I am one of the few people left here who are experienced bomb putter togetherness. After leaving the project, Slotin had planned to return to teaching. This brings us to the 21st of May 1946, and at around 3 pm, Slotin was preparing to demonstrate an experiment to his replacement, 36 year old Alvin C. Graves. The experiment would involve two spheres of beryllium. The two parts put together around the core would create a neutron reflector and the experiment was used to create one of the first steps in a fission reaction. One half of the beryllium sphere had a small hole in the top of it to allow an operator to hold onto it to enable manual lowering, and shims were used to prevent the two halves from touching which would cause a criticality accident. The shims made a rudimentary, albeit effective, method of protection. However, Slotin had developed a unique modification to the experiment. He, instead of using shims, would use a single flat blade screwdriver to separate the two half spheres, meaning that during an experiment, both hands of the operator would be used, one holding the top half via the hole with their thumb, and the other spacing the sphere with the tip of the screwdriver. Slotin had done the experiment in this fashion several times to observers, even reportedly prompting Enrico Fermi to tell Slotin that he'd be dead within a year if he carried on using this dangerous method. So well known was the danger of using a screwdriver that the experiment got the nickname Tickling the Tail of the Dragon. I think we can see where this is going. During the experiment, around 3.20pm, the inevitable happened as the flathead screwdriver slipped in Slotin's right hand, causing the top half sphere to close over the core. The core went supercritical, causing the air around it to ionise, making an eerie blue glow. The intense burst of neutron radiation was released into the room as Slotin experienced a sour taste in his mouth. Slotin's left hand started to burn, immediately causing him to throw his arm in the air, in doing so knocking off the top sphere onto the floor, ending the criticality incident, in total only lasting a couple of seconds. Slotin had prevented any further reaction, and his position over the core had inadvertently shielded the other occupants in the room, including Alvin, who had received a high but not deadly dose of radiation. However, this ensured that Slotin was not so lucky. Slotin vomited after leaving the laboratory and was immediately hospitalised. His body was covered in blisters and had experienced burns on some of his internal organs in what a doctor would describe as three-dimensional sunburn. Seven days after exposure, Slotin experienced extreme mental confusion and after his lips went blue, he was placed inside an oxygen tent, eventually slipping into a coma. He died of his exposure with his parents at his side after nine days, despite having received intensive care. Three other witnesses to the experiment would remain in hospital after Slotin's tragic death. Alvin Graves developed symptoms of acute radiation sickness and although surviving, would live with chronic neurological and vision problems. He would continue to work in nuclear testing until his death in 1965 after a heart attack. One other personnel member would die around the same time as Graves of leukemia. However, it is impossible to tell for certain due to the demon core. Also, the guard on duty during Daglian's experiment would die at the age of 62, also of leukemia. Sadly, the core took the lives of two very talented scientists, but it just shows how deadly radiation can be and how complacency, even with the most skilled of operators, is not the most ideal thing around dangerous materials. The core's destination was going to be intended for Operation Crossroads after the experiments. However, due to the slotting criticality incident, some time was needed to re-evaluate the core's effectiveness for use in a bomb. Ironically, it would be due to its criticality incidents that the core would not be used for weapons detonation, instead it was melted down for use in other cores. Due to the criticality accidents, no more experiments would be done by hand, instead using remotely controlled machines, allowing the operator to be located in a safe room away from radiation. However, this would not completely remove casualties from criticality accidents, but they will be subjects for future videos. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. If you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comments. If you'd like to support the channel financially, then you're in luck as I have a Patreon and the link is in the description. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.